um, transformation of thought, desire, and action. Oh, we got the meeting recorded. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot to do that. I see the little sign on there. Sorry. I probably should have done that earlier. I just forgot. <laughs> but that's fine. Thank you. I, I forgot totally. Um, so we are recording this. <clears throat> And uh, there's a scripture passage that always puzzled me that um, until I got, it was cleared up for me by this little book of the Gospels, and all they had was a heading over it that said, oh, that, that's what that means. But it's where Jesus said, um, the eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light, but if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And I thought, well, that's kind of like primitive view of anatomy, you know, like what, what's he talking about with our eyes and stuff, you know. And uh, th this little book had a heading over it that said the uh, importance of proper motivation. I was like, oh, I get it. So if your whole, and you know, it really comes back to what we we're talking about, the biblical world view. If your way of looking at things is not in line with, you know, is wrong, then everything that you do will be wrong. You know, everything you do will be reacting. Like somebody has said about people who have uh, schizophrenia, you know, they act so strangely, but they're reacting to what their experience is. They're act reacting normally to their abnormal you know, perceptions, you know. So uh, if we perceive things through the, you know, the eyes of God, then we are going to, you know, that's the most important thing. Instead of just doing this thing or that thing, oh, somebody said do this, I'll do that, you know. So if you really have the vision, then, you know, you're going to be uh, in good shape. Uh, so anyway, uh, so uh, we're, well, we're look at my little notes here. So Jesus is talking about the, the biblical worldview. And certain events can quickly and dramatically alter our point of view. And I think of like St. Paul's dramatic conversion. We talked about that, um, you know, from being a persecutor of Christ to uh, an apostle of Christ. And all of a sudden everything changed for him and he saw things differently and the scales fell from his eyes. Remember, he was blinded and, uh, you know, and, uh, and what, who was it? Anna? Ananias, I think, came and laid hands on him. And the scales fell from his eyes and he saw everything differently. Um, and so sometimes, you know, that happens, that has to happen to all of us. It has to happen to all of us, but it has, it, for most of us, it takes many events and over time that we are, you know, have that conversion like we were talking about last week. And um, due to original sin, we need to constantly adjust our vision, I think. You know, we're always learning. And uh, I remember uh, in the book, they were talking about St. Therese, and she said, when I was 13 years old, I thought, well, what else could I learn about perfection, you know? And uh, you know, she soon learned that the more you know about it, the more you know how far you have to go still. Uh, and uh, that's been my experience. Uh, so, you know, we're, in this chapter, they talk a lot about um, St. Therese and, uh, you know, uh, and John of the Cross. And, uh, you know, let me just ask you, like, if you were going to invite one person to dinner, it could either be St. John of the Cross or St. Therese. Who would invite John of the Cross? I mean, <laughs> you would. <laughs> oh, or like kind of a wet blanket, you know, kind of a oh no, He's kind of wonderful. a downer. I mean, Teresa, she's like so sweet and nice, and then <laughs> naive. <laughs> Saint John of the Cross is one of my favorites. He wouldn't even eat anyway. <laughs> he, uh, but you know, I think though, you know, his seriousness was. I don't. I was trying to find out something. A lot of these people, you know, you look at a biography of them and they don't really say much about their personality, you know, but uh, I think John was very serious 
but uh, he probably his love for you know made up for that that he was not like uh there is a kind of person who is just going to always tell you you know oh you're doing the wrong thing i don't think he was that kind of a person he was somebody who's always trying to help you to do the right thing and his love for god was what came through um but anyway uh you know some of the things that we were talking about in terms of uh you know change uh and, and he was talking about, um, we, you know, I think we really owe Ralph Martin a debt of gratitude for boiling down a, a lot of St. John of the Cross uh, and his discussion of, you know, the proper uh, joy in things. Like you have a disordered joy, or what, what's, what's the word? Uh, inappropriately rejoicing in temporal goods. And... Uh, <clears throat> And the same way, you know, applying those to the other types of things in your life that you could be rejoicing about. And, you know, what he said was nothing but what belongs to the service of God should be our joy. So that's kind of the one thing, you know, and he's saying some things like, you know, two people are married. What are they so happy about unless it's for the glory of God, you know, or, you know, whatever it is that you're rejoicing in. It's not, you shouldn't rejoice in it unless it's, you know, the service of God, you know. And so that sounds, you know, you might think like, oh, he's really taking the fun out of everything. Uh, but it also kind of resonates with you, you know, to think about uh, why you rejoice in things. And there's a way of, you know, you have fun, you watch like a TV show and it's funny and you laugh and that's... But, you know, if it's joking about some things and it makes you think like, well, you know, this world's in a pretty big mess. It's not really anything to be laughing at. It's not, you know, funny. Uh, but, you know, when you really see people doing good things and, you know, you rejoice in that, you rejoice in think people, you know, coming to God or people, God working in our lives, you know, sometimes we're praying for things and things aren't happening but other things happen that are that we rejoice in um so you know i think that that's something that you, we have to grow into that attitude i'm sure john of the cross that was just it for him like he wouldn't rejoice in anything that wasn't in the service of god but you know i think that for me I go, I got some work to do, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that, um, there's always things that, uh, I, you know, I think that we should like, if you're doing physical exercise, you say, okay, I'm going to lose some weight. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to do this exercise. So you go down, you know, get up early and you do some, you know, put on an exercise show or you go out to the gym and you work out. And then you come in, I was like, well, that didn't do anything. Look, the heck, you know, I haven't changed at all. And, you know, but it's incremental. You expect to be sticking with it for a while. And I think that's the same thing with the spirituality. Um, it's incremental growth, you know. So we should always, you know, whatever stage we're at, we should be trying to uh, challenge ourselves to stretch a little bit about, you know. I think some things would sound... Uh, you know, at one point in my life, certain things would sound like, oh, you know, that's, that's really kind of, you know, harsh to, you know, that's really hard to feel that way about, about things. But if you stretch, if, if that's a goal to, to be more like that, we can always stretch just a little bit and, you know, have more things. Um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are things that each of us could think of like that we have and that we enjoy, but we could easily give them up. Um, but then there are other things that maybe are a little harder, you know, to, to that we're a little bit more attached to. And, uh, and it's really not for the glory of God. It's just because we like it. And maybe those are the kind of things we can sort of make a little bit of a stretch and put more things from column A into column B, you know, um, to, uh, you know, the whole idea is by ceasing our disordered joy in created things, we find the key to the pure joy of those same things. And I have a little note to turn to page 98, where, yeah, I wrote it down. 
Okay. Who wants to read here? We could read that little um, paragraph there, which is from John of the Cross on page 98. Andy, you never say anything. Why don't you read? <laughs> Mute yourself. Go ahead. What do you want me to read? So, so it's talking about um, the liberty of spirit that, you know, that you'll oh. rediscover a greater Thank joy. You. Can you see? Yep. Yeah. Those who liberty deny spirit. themselves. Liberty of spirit, clarity of reason, rest, tranquility, peaceful confidence in God. You want me to read that whole section, right? Yeah, keep going. They will obtain more joy and rec recreation in, <laughs> maybe to give some glasses. <laughs> One moment, please. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, no you yeah. can't see. I can't see us. Oh, there's enough light. I don't have enough light here. <laughs> Reading glasses. Okay. They will obtain more joy and recreation in creatures with the dis dispossession of them. They cannot rejoice in them if they behold them with possessiveness, for this is a care that, like a trap, holds the spirit to earth and does not allow wideness of heart. Those then whose joy is unpossessive of things rejoice them all as though they possess them all. Those others beholding them with possessive mind lose all the delight of them all in general. The former, as St. Paul states, though they have nothing in their heart, possess everything with greater liberty. The others, insofar as they possess things with attachment, neither have nor possess anything. Mm. Rather, their heart is held by things, and they suffer as a captive, and spend all their time going to and fro without the snare to which their heart is tied. Mm. So, yeah, when I mm -hmm. think that when you you're trying to own something, or you're afraid you're going to lose it, or you know, control it, and mm -hmm. uh, you think that you're happiness depends on that, then you are more of a slave to that thing than that thing is serving you. But if you're free of, you know, attachment to it, then you're, uh, you know, as he says, you're, you're in, uh, able to, you have everything you have. And, you know, then it goes on to um, talk about St. Therese. And uh, she's a little bit more chipper about things, but she's talking about the same things, you know, she, she's got this, you know, she's very charming and, you know, this sweet tone, but she's talking about the same idea, uh, you know, and there's a lot of information about her life, and you could see how her relationships with the church, her family, nature, they all fueled her spiritual life, and she's going through the normal stages of growing up, but under the influence of her pious family and the church and everything, and basically the generous grace of God, each of those stages brings her closer to union with God. So I like the really the, the session where she's talking about she was in the garden and just being quiet and looking around at, at things and coming to an appreciation of how the things of nature are so beautiful, but they all pass away and that God is eternal and how much more beautiful the eternal joys of heaven and uh and then she realized she was meditating you know that she was just doing it you know and uh i think that's something that we should be aware of too that uh you know we have we're trying to learn how to pray and to meditate and to grow spiritually but i think it just happens by the grace of god in in these situations uh, just like it did to her um and also when she was watching her father pray that was kind of a meditation there you know she was in church and wasn't paying attention to the sermon. She was watching him being the devout person that he was. And so, um, but anyway, we'll get to some discussion here. Um, I have a question for us to talk about in our own little groups. And let me see if I can, well, it's actually two questions in one. Where's my screen sharing thing? Uh -huh. right thing up here. Okay. Can everybody see that? When you hear nothing but what belongs to the service of God should be our joy. Do you feel joy 
or resistance? And what are some of the th things that seems that this seems difficult to apply to in your life? We got that. And then we'll. Could you leave it up just a little longer? Yeah, sure. We... We'll we'll okay. leave that up there. And we'll try to go ten minutes in our breakout room. Oh, I know too. Hey. Yeah. I got out of gallery view somehow. Let's put that back in. We're back. Sorry about that. I lost track of time. <laughs> that's okay. That's I think that's just about right. Oh, okay. Um Okay, well let's see. Uh so uh Kate, do you wanna yes. talk about what you guys talked about? Who were you in the group? Oh, yes. Uh with um Deborah and Andy. Andrew. Andrew. Thank Andy. you. Um, and um, well, we started out saying how we both wanted to talk to uh, visit with St. John rather than St. Therese, but <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked about we, we talked about a lot of stuff. Some of it was the question. <laughs> um, That's fine. Um, I'm trying to remember, you know, I remember what I said and I'm trying to remember what you guys said because I feel like I always talk about what I said and forget to say what what you, what you all did. Um, and see, it's gone. We, I, I know, like I said, I was talking about how discipline is freedom. I, I found that at first, at least, I was having trouble with the... Um, with the question, you know, your question was resistance or I, I felt resistance. You know, I felt that, like, you know, somebody when we were in before said you pulled the joy out of everything, you know, mm -hmm. and and that was kind of my first thing. But but as I read on, there was a. Um, a point. Where they they talked about, well, there's the disordered joy. They said joy isn't bad. It's a disordered joy. And we were talking about how if it if it owns you, if it possesses you, then you have no freedom and you can't, um, that's not real joy, you know, you're really bound up by it. So you guys add in, because like I said, I always feel like I, I don't fully represent. <laughs> that, that's fine. You got anything to add, Deb? Or? Yeah, we were just talking about the difference, like the service, you know, when you belong to the service of God, it's a chosen thing. You're choosing to be connected and um, with the service of God. And so that can foster, it actually can foster joy because it's the true joy. It's not an attachment to something where it's almost like it could, you could possibly consider even addictions. Mm. When people become addicted to something, they're not having the true joy. They might have started off wanting that. They're looking for it, but they've become attached to it. So the joy of being in God is, in the service of God, is freer. And it's oh, it's a more uh, uplifting joy. It's not attached. It's more of a detached and free, but it's still a choice. So that's where the service, like the service of God, you're in service of God. You're in connection with God. You're loving in whatever way you're called to be loving other people in God. Um, so it, that's where the thing about the joy, you know, joy, when it's actually truly connected and un united with God. Mm. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's great. So, uh, Jen, you want to, I know how much you like to talk. Do you want to talk about what you guys um, were talking about? Yeah, we, we were, we were talking, well, we talked about first what it meant, but um, I think, I don't really want to put words in Diane's mouth, so just correct me if I'm wrong, Diane. I think that she really felt like there's a line there to be walked, 
and to be careful and to listen to the Holy Spirit to guide her and that she has moments where God steps in and it's very clear that the moment and the service and the joy is in God. Is that right? Is that good, Diane? Hmm. Um, yeah, it's following what, Debbie, what you're saying. It's not a joy because it's something or, you know, something we like. It, it's, it's after you reflect, you realize you were in the service of God and you accepted that. And there's a joy that actually comes as, as a result of that. So you, and, and you were saying, Jen, too, that there's joy's always there. We have the choice. In the service of God, we're talking. You have, we have the choice. In the absence of, like, evil or addiction. I mean, I'm, like, ordinary life. Ordinary people who are, who are trying to be close to God. I think in every moment, you have the choice. Does this bring you closer to the joy of God or does it bring you further away? And not that you always recognize it in the moment. I'm just saying the choice is always there, I think. And I just want to add, because this is, because of the resistance, you're talking joy and resistance. I was telling Jen, there are times, because I don't, you don't know this is happening when it's happened and then you realize you were in the service of God and there's joy, but there's times where something might come in my mind and I'm thinking, no, no, that's just my mind thinking I'm over analyzing or whatever. And I feel like, is that my resisting or am I, mm. and that's a different experience than when I'm in the service of God with, with the joyful feeling. So Dan, maybe you can, cause that, that's a real, that gets into the psychology of, is that, is that the resistance? And that's why we're always growing, but I'd be curious to read or know more about that because that word resistance mm. is there in that question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, uh, that's, I've, I've, I don't want to get too deep into this thing because that's not what we're talking about, but uh, when you're talking about addictions and you know, I was talking a little bit about my food issues and stuff, and so much of addiction, you know, so much of our choices in life are basically our brain wants chemicals, you know, <laughs> and we act on our brain saying, do this because it feels good, you know, because I want, you know, whether it's alcohol or drinking or cookies or, you know, or a certain person or, you know, whatever, TV, internet, you know, all these things uh, that make us, uh, you know, just sort of do things. Um, and so it's it's hard to sort it out sometimes, but I I think like what you're saying, I think I mean maybe we I know I've experienced where you're doing something it may not be like your favorite thing to do, but you know that's what God wants you to do, and you have joy in that. You know. So, Linda, you want to talk about what we <laughs> talked about? Well, I um, okay, I'm not unmuted. Okay, um. I just took this whole thing about service to God as being, well, we are created to know, to love, and to serve God. And so our service to God is our life, our state of life. And for me, I, I love I love doing stuff around the church. I mean, that's just, I love being there. I love being in the church in the presence of Jesus. And I volunteer, you know, in different aspects, you know, cleaning or, or, you know, presiding over Eucharistic adoration or, you know, just different things, singing in the choir or any, any of that and all. And that bring, brings me great joy. Uh, also, you know, min, you know, serving my neighbors, you know, if somebody's sick and they need a meal or something like that, I'll do that. That, that gives me great joy. It, course you get a lot of feedback from those sort of things you know from outside sources but also serving part of my state in life is cleaning the toilets <laughs> I don't get any joy from that <laughs> and uh so you know so that's why I was telling them that uh Dan and uh, Paul that uh Saint Therese was my confirmation name so I've done a lot of study with St. Therese and, and her little way is what, what gets me through. <laughs> you know? mm. And, and it's all, it's all service to God. And, and, um, I still don't get joy from cleaning the toilets, <laughs> but 
I know it's all for it's all for the good, you know, it's all for God, you know. So yeah, anyway, I mean, that that's my story and I'll stick to it. And I do a terrible job for speaking for anybody else. So Paul, I'd love it if you <laughs> you would, would say what you had said. Anything you want to add to that, Paul? Or? Um, well, the, uh, you know, I thought Irish kind of, I, I think our group didn't attack the question directly. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we had, a, we had a really good discussion about, uh, you know, how, and, and, and I guess what my thought was that St. Therese, you know, she had this kind of like perfect upbringing, you know, we, we can imagine like what a perfect Catholic upbringing would, would look like, you know, holy parents, uh, loving sisters, you know, big family, uh, big supportive community, and so on and so forth. And, and yet when you read her life, there's all this turmoil going on underneath. There's all this struggle that she talks about, and you wouldn't think this is a young lady, a young girl almost. And yet, her insights are really amazing uh, of how she worked through those, uh, the attachments she had to overcome, the attachments to her own family members. Um, you know, that's one we don't think of, you know, attach, you know, how do we love our, our, our parents, our children and everything, but do we have inordinate attachments, you know? And I, and I think of that sometimes like, how sometimes as parents we can uh, influence our children a little too much in particular directions about where we think their future ought to go. Uh, college choices, for example, or whatever, you know, and, you know, and you want to provide good guidance, but, you know, how much of it is good guidance and how much of it is us projecting what we would like them to do and all. So there, you know, there's different things there, but but St. Teresa, to, you know, that part of it really kind of uh, struck me uh, that she continued to struggle all the way to the end uh, and recognizing that even in the end, she wasn't perfect and still needed the grace of God. Great. Thanks. Yeah, that was one thing that I think that she's like, she was, they were correcting her. She's like just about ready to die. And, you know, she was you know, getting upset with somebody and I corrected her and she's like, oh, this is great. I'm still not perfect, you know? And I'm like, well, that's, that's the attitude to have, you know, uh, uh, to, to rejoice in, you know, the fact that you're not perfect, you know, not just to, because, you know, you can't hide anything from God. God knows what, how perfect or imperfect you are, you know, and you're not going to do anything to impress him. He just wants you to be with him. So, um, so that's uh, beautiful. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, the way I worded the question was more about, uh, you know, things you're attached to and letting go of things. But I think what some of the people were talking about is embracing the difficult things, you know, like the, the difficult people and the, you know, cleaning the toilets and dealing with those people and trying to find joy in that, you know, uh, joy in, it, it, well, you know, one, one thing that, you know, before we move on is to think about, Jesus uh, giving up his life and all that he had to go through out of love for us. Um, and, you know, they don't say that he was skipping down the road with that cross, like that he was really happy about it, but he did it out of love. And, uh, you know, somebody quoted uh, Mother Teresa's to everything, you know, with love, you know. So, so we're going to move on to the next chapter. The struggle against sin. So we're going to talk about sin. And uh, that's, you know, I think that I was thinking about this. The, the great thing about this book, it sort of makes you reflect on your own life. And my life, um, you know, if I'm honest, I think I tolerated a certain level of sin in my life. And it was kind of like, well, everybody kind of does this and nobody's perfect. You know, it's one thing for Teresa, St. Therese to say, oh, thank God I'm not perfect at the end of her life. And there's another thing to say, well, nobody's perfect and just not bother to change. You know, it's a whole different, <laughs> whole different way of, of saying the same thing. Um, you know, I recognize that 
if I was wanted to be perfect, that I should stop doing some of the things. And I think I kind of thought of like, someday I'll get serious about it and I'll take care of that. I'll get rid of that sin. And it kind of reminded me of this friend of mine who, uh, you know, he tried to quit smoking. He quit smoking for like two weeks and then he started smoking again. He said, well, at least I know I can quit, you know, because I did. <laughs> he wasn't ready, you know. And by the way, this guy quit smoking after like 50 years of smoking. He recently just quit, you know. But um, so so I decided, you know, at some point in my life, has, you know, I'm reading these books and studying and praying and God wants you to be without sin at all, you know. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get serious with this sin. And all of a sudden I was like, hey, it's I can't do this. <laughs> you know? It's not going away. I'm not you know, it's not that easy to just change like that. And that's where the word struggle, you know, the struggle against sin. Um, it's not easy. And, and St. Francis de Sales, he talked about him in this chapter, talks about an affection for certain sins, you know, that, uh, you know, it's like you're doing something, you know, like when you're a little kid and you're having a great time drawing on the walls, you know, and then your mother comes in and starts yelling at you for drawing on the walls. And you feel bad because it made your mother unhappy and you got yelled at. But you don't, you want to draw on the walls, you know. <laughs> it's like what makes you happy. And there's a lot of things in life that are like that. Like we say like, oh, I can't do that because God doesn't want me to do that, you know. But we're not, it's, we don't own that feeling, you know. We're not doing it out of love for God. Um and, you know, I was talking about, you know, I don't eat chocolate chip cookies, but when they make the chocolate chip cookies, I put my nose in there, I smell them, and, you know, <laughs> it's this beautiful thing, it's attraction to them. As opposed to uh, St. Paul, who said, uh, you know, everything that I used to be so proud of that I was, you know, everything I knew and believed and was so proud of, it's all just a bunch of rubbish. I don't think of it at all, you know, it's just garbage because I have Christ, you know, and that's you know, so that's the transformation as opposed to, you know, I think that's how we can give up sin is when we kind of uh, go for the love of God and see, you know, believe that whatever God lo loves is good and whatever God doesn't love is bad. And, and we have to have that, that attitude. And um, St. John says that no one who lives in him, in Jesus, keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. And that's kind of, a, I'm reading that, it's like, well, there it is in the Bible, you know? Like, so you think, oh, I know God, I, you know, make it progress. So why are you keep sinning, you know? So, uh, uh, but, but then the next thing about this chapter begins with St. Bernard saying how, no matter how bad we are, you don't want to give up and say, oh, well, I guess I don't love God. I'm doomed, you know, I, I'm not doing... I keep sinning, I'm doomed, I'm giving up. And St. Bernard makes a point, no matter how bad you are, all the awful things you're ever doing, God is calling you to holiness and God is, wants to help you uh, to deal with your sin and to get rid of it. And, um, and he talks about true devotion. And, you know, he was a different from other, a lot of saints at his time or up to that time that were writing books about holiness for monks and nuns and, and they not much for lay people in the active life. And, uh, and he's pointing out how you could be, you know, saying all these prayers and think you're being truly devout, but you're, meanwhile, you're saying bad things about other people or you're jealous of somebody or, you know, and that's not true devotion. You know, true devotion is uh, living a virtuous life. It's doing the right thing and loving people and loving your neighbor and helping people and not sinning, you know, getting away from sin. Uh, and, you know, hopefully praying the rosary and, you know, fasting and all the other things that we might be doing as part of our, you know, devotions will be leading to that, will help us with that. Uh, that's, that's the idea. Uh, but that they in themselves are not, you know, true devotion. And uh, so the important thing is, that, you know, the first step is getting rid of sin, especially mortal sin. 
and uh, along with the firm resolution to stop, the sacrament of reconciliation is very important. And um, I know I was struggling with some things, and I hadn't gone to confession for a really long time, just because I was embarrassed, you know. You know, who wants to go and just tell everybody the bad things you did, you know? Um, but the more you do it, then the more progress you make, I think, you know, even if you like, you say, Oh, I did the same thing again. One time priest said, well, that's better if you came in and you had a different sin every time, you know, like, <laughs> you know, doing something new. It was, uh, Father Nato was like, you know, you don't want to hear you guys, somebody's doing, trying new sin every week. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, does, does everybody, anybody have any question about, uh, the difference between mortal sin and venial sin? Everybody kind of straight on that? Do we have to go over that? Um, okay, sounds like we're, we're on the, you know, because sometimes people are not really sure what, what that means. Um, but, you know, here's a little quote from uh, John, the Apostle John again, which talks about uh, mortal and venial sin. He says, if anyone sees his brother sinning, if the sin is not deadly, he should pray to God and he will give him life. This is only for those whose sin is not deadly. There is such a thing as a deadly sin about which I do not say that you should pray. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that is not deadly. And basically, you know, there was, there was a proverb that says the righteous, righteous man sins 70 times a day, I think something like that, you know. You can't help but make mistakes and do little things that are imperfect and you know uncharitable or whatever but uh uh you know if, if you're there's certain things that are very serious and grave and those are the the mortal sins and you know that doesn't stop us from you know if we know what they are it doesn't stop us from doing them uh and so you know we have to really really think about that you're separating yourself from god um but the other part of it is that uh and one of the things that I think we can learn a lot from Alcoholics Anonymous and the other, you know, addiction things, and maybe the church should be called Sinners Anonymous, you know, that, uh, you know, we're really trying to, it's something we're trying to give up. And if it's something you that's hurting you, it's hurting, you don't like it, but you're still doing it. I mean, that's very similar to any addiction, you know, uh, and one of the things that they talk about is you realize that you have no control that you know uh that god is you have to put trust in god for all of this for anything that is going to happen uh and that you know so that that's a, a it's part of aa but it's also part of um uh, you know the gospel and and what we're talking about here in, in prayer is that you're you have to trust in god to to take care of those sins and to help you become holy. Like I said before, you're not going to impress God. Like, you know, I kind of thought that way. I was like, okay. And I remember it was like one particular sin that I was like, oh, if I can get rid of this, I will be like Mr. Holy and, you know, all this grace is going to come. And like I did. And then I was like, and nothing happened. You know, like I thought all of a sudden I would be like working miracles and, you know, and, and I, and I was mad. I was like, come on, God, you know, this is, this is real spiritual maturity here, you know, uh, but it's like, uh, you know, God is not going to be impressed. We're not going to say like, oh God, look what I did. And he'd be like, oh, that's amazing. I could never have done that. You know, <laughs> it's not going to happen, you know? Um, so, you know, it's all God. And that doesn't mean like that, that it's, you know, that we're, you know, we shouldn't feel bad about that. We should be, feel great about that because God wants us to participate in that. God wants to use us into all his holy, you know, make us part of his holy world, you know, and, and, and do his work. And so that's, that's a real blessing. And uh, so uh, there's a quote from the book, hatred for sin is important confidence in the mercy of god is even more important so that's you know we should hate sin and i think we're all there like when you do something that you really feel bad about you don't want to talk to god you want to you want to hide like adam and eve you know like 
put on a fig leaf or something, but that's when you should go to God and say, God, I need your help. You know, that's, that's where it comes from. And uh, I just wanted to mention one other thing before we break. Um, scrupulosity is, a, a, you know, I think when you get into this level of saying, you know, trying to work on your life and eliminate sin, it's sort of like the, uh, somebody said, where OCD meets faith, you know, that you are trying to, and you start thinking about every single little thing that you did. Is that a sin or is that pleasing to God? Am I going to go to hell for this? You know, like you, you know, you didn't, you missed your morning prayer because you were, you know, too long taking a shower. Oh my God, what do I do? You know, um, and that's a real, that's a, like a mental illness. It's a, it's a, a thing that, you know, people have to struggle with and hopefully we won't, none of us will have that. But if you do have that ever, um, please let somebody know and get help for that because it's, it's quite different from what we're talking about here uh, in terms of, uh, you know, letting God work in your life and growing in the spirit. So we're going to break up again sure. and uh, it's getting late, but I did we get my email, you know, so we're going to go a little later. I didn't hear any, any uh, objections to that. So we're going to keep going. So let me see. Here's our, Next question. Share the screen. I'm getting so good at this. Okay, so two questions. Do you think you have made progress in this struggle against sin? And are there things that used to be very attractive to you that you now think of as so much rubbish? So, um, you know, this is kind of a sensitive topic. This is not confession here. So, uh, you know, we could talk in a general way, but don't feel, don't feel like you have to hear your soul about, you know, awful things you did. Um, but let's take those questions. Uh, you know, have you made progress in this struggle? We're back. <laughs> Warped back into our our room here. So, um, well, it's it's getting late, even with all our you know trying to condense things here. Uh, can we just have a, a few lines from uh, a few words about what we talked about in our groups? Kate, why don't you speak for our group here? Okay, um, I took notes this time, so. I will start with me. I, I said um, basically, you know, that I felt like I had made progress, but not nearly as much as I would have liked to. Um, Dan, Dan said that, that he thought he was doing good until he actually tried to stop, make some progress. And then he realized it was harder than he thought, <laughs> I guess. And, um, and Paul, I, I love the, the quote from St. Augustine, um, Lord, make me holy, just not yet. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, but then we, we got into a, a discussion on the um, how well the church catechizes what is sin and mortal sin and venial sin. And, and you know, especially, I, I think we learn it as kids, but then maybe as adults, we could use a little refresher and we don't get that, you know, like on the, the catechism. So mm. I think that's a pretty good some that was of ours. A great summary. Good. <laughs> Who's next? Deb. Deb. How about you, Deborah? You have something to say for your group? Did you say Deb? I did. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I heard you right. That's so you. we were with yes, we were with Diane, our group. And um, I guess in general, as we've gotten older, we felt like we are making progress um, in the struggle against sin. Um, I know for myself, it's very similar sin. So the progress is not always <laughs> slow going. I can see progress, but it's a repeating thing. Mm. <laughs> it's definitely repeating thing. Um, we talked about... The other one was, are, are there things that used to be 
your the things that you're considering as rubbish now, so much rubbish. So we talked a little bit about that and about how we looked at that in terms of our thoughts about things, clinging to like maybe our ideas on things that they may not have been in the, you know, as what we're attached to, what we're thinking about may have changed over the years and realizing what really is important so that the stuff we cared about in the past is rubbish. It could be ideas that we cling, cl heh, clung to or things or, mm -hmm. um, you know, goals like owning a home, these things like as um, we've gotten older, our priorities on what's, um, you know, what's a value and what's a rubbish have, have shifted. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's sufficient, but <laughs> do you have anything else, Diane, you want to share? <laughs> and we actually got off the beaten path, talked about our roots, because they grew up in Madawaska and Fort Kent, and I grew up in Van Buren. So if you know this, the map, it's like one town next to each other in the St. John Valley. <laughs> So yeah. well, I had not really had that conversation with them, but that's great. And we talked a little bit about uh, the sacrament of uh, reconciliation and our different experiences of that as well. Andy, did you want to share anything? About what? About what we talked about. Oh, we also brought up about kids nowadays. Now you're talking about the rubbish that they're dealing with a lot more than we used to at their age. You know, when we had dreams that, that uh, we think as rubbish now, but they're not even having those dreams because they're they're disillusioned. Mm. It's a hard, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. So I think we had uh, Linda and Jen together there. Yeah, Jen, you wanna <laughs> start? Um, I think that. The consensus of our group was as you get older, for various reasons, you get more serious about it. And you start to really try hard to make progress. You see life as finite, you see mistakes you've made in the past, um, see the consequences of some of your sinful choices. And so that really spurs you on at that time of life to, to make an extra effort to make progress, I guess. And Linda shared with us, she talked about the sacrament of reconciliation and how that has really aided her um, in her progress. Um, I don't know, I, <laughs> but I left out Roseanne. Sorry, Roseanne, you, you, uh, you go ahead. <laughs> Rose, did you want to say about your, what you had to say? I don't know if Rose can um, Well, I, I just unmuted muted myself. Um, I just, the only thing I commented on, there's a one phrase in the catechism that uh, talks about um, loving God so much that the concept of hurting him with sin becomes so disdainful to you that you just can't tolerate it. And uh, that sort of being a driving force that I think um, was important for me in improvement. <laughs> mm. You know, um, we didn't me we didn't mention this thing in our group, but what when you talked about that about the concept of sin hurting God, it reminded me of reading in one of the previous chapters where God said to saint faustina if he ever showed her the how um the state of her soul you know how wretched she was and i thought oh uh saint faustina was wretched <laughs> and you know i what actually that me? <laughs> i know i know so that's what i took you know the last time i went to confession i actually went in there and i said you know, I've been trying to think about how wretched I am because I said to Jen, you know, if you ever want to know what your sins are, just ask your family, you know. <laughs> so, because <laughs> I sometimes have the opposite problem. I don't know what my sins are, you know. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it's really worthwhile to just say, oh, you know, uh, show me where I'm really wretched. Mm. Because uh, yeah. I'm sure I am. 
just as my husband. <laughs> just as your husband. Well, well yeah, I, I think that um, I this is another one of these things that's not a teaching of the church. It's just one of my ideas. But, uh, you know, Jesus in the Passion, we see him suffering so much with the cross and, the, you know, losing all that blood and the crown of thorns. And sometimes I think that the um, the physical suffering was almost a relief for him from the spiritual suffering of bearing our sins. You know, it wasn't just like that he suffered physically, but that he had to take on our sins. He took on that guilt of having done all the things that, you know, mm -hmm. that everybody has ever done that was sinful, you know. Um, and, you know, took that upon himself. It wasn't just like some symbolic thing. Like he, like St. Paul says, he became sin, you know. So sometimes, you know, I hope it depends on how, you know, you view things negatively or positively. But to think about, you know, how does that hurt God? We think, oh, well, nothing can hurt God. God is perfect. But he chooses to be vulnerable to us and, you know, out of love. So, mm -hmm. Well, what's um, how about we uh, make a little uh, resolution to pray for each other this week and, uh, you know, pray that we can uh, make a little bit of progress in the struggle against sin and, the, you know, the uh, trying to be holier people. I'll be praying for you. So I guess we got to wrap it up. We'll say the Our Father. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we'll we'll call it a night. So, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. All right. Unmute yourself. You can say good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you so Bye. much for coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.